cardiovascular disease, ischemic heart disease, atherosclerosis, angina pectoris, and valvular heart disease. Ischemic heart disease, angina pectoris. The right and left coronary arteries arise from the sinuses of Valsalva at the first branch of the aorta. The right coronary artery passes deep in the right atrioventricular groove and usually terminates as a posterior distending coronary artery in the posterior interventricular groove. The right coronary artery supplies multiple right ventricular branches and the right marginal artery. In 90% of patients, the right coronary artery gives rise to the posterior distending artery, right coronary dominance, and branches into an anterior nodal artery and several terminal postlateral left ventricular branch. The left main coronary artery is usually about one centimeter long and gives rise to the left anterior descending and left circumflex coronary arteries. The left anterior descending artery provides several diagonal branch to the diagonal branch uh, to the anterior wall of the left ventricular and a number of perforating branches to the intraventricular septum. In most patients, the left anterior descending artery wraps the apex of the heart and is stomodic with the posterior descending artery. The left anterior descending artery usually is the largest and most important of the coronary arteries. The circumflex coronary artery lies in the left atrioventricular groove and proceeds laterally and posteriorly around the lateral aspect of the left ventricle, usually terminating in several circumflex marginal arteries. In 9 in 10 persons of uh, patients, the circumflex coronary artery provides the posterior descending coronary artery, left coronary dominance. Coronary blood flow delivers oxygen and metabolic substrates to the myocardium and simultaneously removes carbon dioxide and metabolic byproducts via transcapillary exchange. Normal coronary blood flow approximates 1 ml per gram of myocardium per minute and delivers 0. 0.1 ml of oxygen per gram per minute to the heart. A high rate of energy utilization compared with the rest of the body. The extraction of oxygen in the coronary bed averages 75% under normal condition and increases to nearly 100% during stress. Coronary artery blood flow occurs primarily during diastole because systolic myocardial contraction increases intramyocardial vascular resistance. Normally mean coronary resistance is three to six times the, the totally vasodilated value, implying an extreme vasodilatator reserve. During stress, oxygen delivery increases as a result uh, of vasodilatation in response to the high baseline oxygen extraction. Assuming adequate perfusion pressure, total and regional myocardial blood flow under normal conditions is determined by autoregulation of regional anterior resistance modulated by local metabolic demand. Pathology Coronary atherosclerosis, 
is a progressive disease whose earliest microscopic changes have been described in the newborn infant. An advanced lesion are present in half the hearts examined at autopsy during the second decade of life. Early lesions are characterized by initial incorporation of livid material progressing to an expanding plaque surrounded by fibrosis and, and calcification. In the final stage, rupture of the intimal plaque appears to be a dominant mechanism of worsening symptoms with a deposition of platelets uh, and thrombus progressing to thrombolytic th thrombotic occlusion and acute myocardial infarction. Subtotal occlusion by dynamic thrombotic plaques appear to be major importance in the pathogenesis of unstable angina. The usual pattern of coronary atherosclerosis is one of the multifocal lesions characteristically involving more than one major trunk in the same heart. The stenosis tend to be short and lesions in the left anterior descending artery and circumflex system are usually proximal. In the right coronary artery, the disease is more diffuse and involves chiefly the proximal and middle portion of the artery. However, the posterior descending artery and distal branch usually are spared. When an atherosclerotic plaque decreases the coronary cross-sectional area by 75%, the resistance to flow becomes significant. The dominant point of coronary vascular resistance becomes the stenosis that limits myocardial perfusion to a fixed value. While flow may be adequate at rest, exercise or other factors that increase myocardial oxygen demand can be produced a relative ischemia a fall in coronary pressure distal to the stenosis and redistribution of blood flow away from, from the subendocardium. This appears to be the mechanism of exercise and induced angina pectoris. Coronary, uh, coronary vasospasm or unstable thrombotic plaque can, be, can compound the obstructive physiology. Because of high metabolic demand and tight coupling between energy utilization and expenditure, acute coronary insufficiency such as occurs with angina pectoris produces an almost immediate decrement in myocardial segment shortening and work. Even when full reperfusion is accomplished after a 15 minutes period of a reversible ischemia, dysfunction can be prolonged requiring 24 48 hours for complete recovery <laughs> clinical findings symptoms and signs the most common 
Symptom of myocardial ischemia is retrosternal chest pain or angina pectoris produced by a reduction in coronary blood flow. The discomfort is often described by the patient as pressure, a choking sensation or a feeling of tightness. Early in the symptom, symptomatic course, a variety of factors such as exercise, cold exposure, eating and emotional stress can initiate the symptoms. The pain frequently radiates down the left arm into into the left neck and occasionally to the right arm, mandible or ear. The severity of chest pain with class first indicated no any symptoms. Class two <coughs> symptoms with severe exertion. Class third, chest pain with mild exertion. And class four, pain at rest. In the late stages, ischemia occurs at rest and is refractory to medical therapy on stable angina. Unstable pain patterns imply a very poor outlook with a high incidence of early infarction and death. A large proportion of patients don't follow the classic symptomatic progression and present initially with acute myocardial infarction or sudden death. Still, others experience no symptoms at all during ischemia, thyroid myocardial ischemia, and coronary artery disease is only discovered in the late stage of congestive heart failure after severe ventricular damage has occurred. The physical examination is frequently unremarkable. Cardiac enlargement may be evident in patients with advanced disease, but the chest radiograph is normal in the majority. While the ECG is normal, in at least half of patients, abnormal findings consist of inverted T waves ST segment abnormalities or Q waves on the resting ECG. Imaging studies. Cardiac catheterization and coronary arteriography are essential for determining the presence and extent of coronary atherosclerosis. In recent years, a trend has favored early angiography in most patients with suspected coronary disease in order to identify individual prognostic characteristics as precisely as possible. This approach has allowed a more objective application of medical therapy to lower risk subsets and selection of patients at high medical risk for elective coronary revascularization. The development of low-cost outpatient catheterization has facilitated this trend. At angiography, the major anatomic predictors of coronary death, such as the number of coronary vessels, 
deceased and the resting left ventricular ejection fraction are documented. While the extent of obstructive disease can be underestimated in up to 10% of patients, coronary arteriography has a higher sensitivity and specificity of any test available. <coughs> Liberal utilization of coronary and geography almost at a first line study is clearly more precise and even perhaps more cost effective than other approaches. In patients with borderline anatomic indications for coronary revascularization, physiologic assessment with radionuclide exercise, ventricular graphy or stress, thallium scanning. Scanning can be useful in making decisions about operative treatment. Treatment. Medical treatment. Hypertension should be controlled and smoking avoided. Lipid abnormalities should be treated with drugs or diet. After bypass grafting, Risk factor modification and continued medical therapy are especially important since atherosclerotic involvement of saphenous vein graft is a major long-term risk. When making a choice between medical and surgical therapy, the natural history of angina pectoris should be reviewed. <coughs> The annual coronary diseases mortality rate is directly related to the number of vessels affected and the degree, degree of impairment of left ventricular function. In current practice, adverse prognostic factors that might suggest referral for coronary revascularization include severe or progressive angina on medical therapy. Refractory unstable angina, significant left main coronary disease, multivessel coronary obstruction, especially with proximal left anterior descending artery involvement, ventricular impairment with a reduced ejection fraction, and evidence of exercise induced ischemia. Each of these factors, individually or in combination, significantly reduce survival with medical therapy and predicts an improved longevity after coronary bypass grafting. In patients with low risk clinical profiles, medical management is recommended of angina symptoms and exercise capacity can be maintained satisfactorily. Sublingual nitroglycerin, long acting nitride preparations, and nitroglycerin ointment can be useful. Beta adrenergic blocking agents such as propranolol, atenolol, and timolol are effective and safe. Verapamil is also effective. Antiplatelet agents such as aspirin have a definitive therapeutic role and short-term heparinization has been effective in preventing coronary thrombosis and infarction in patients with unstable angina. Evidence exists, however, that, that the symptomatic efficacy of these drugs may not be directly associated with major improvement in ultimate outcome.
Moreover, recent data indicate that long-term coronary morbidity and mortality are significantly reduced after contemporary, after contemporary coronary bypass in all forms of coronary disease, even single vessels abstraction. This finding implies that coronary revascularization should be considered in the majority of patient and that long-term medical management should be discouraged. Surgical treatment. It is essential that the goals and anticipated results of coronary bypass be explained objectively and in detail to patient and family. Risk and possible complications should be discussed and all aspects of the history, physical examination and results of cardiac catheterization should be reviewed with emphasis or imparting knowledge about cardiac anatomy and dynamics. The presence of carotid fluids should be evaluated and respiratory status, renal function and blood coagulation should be assessed. Aspirin should be discontinued, if possible, for one to two weeks prior to operation because of an increased risk of post-operative bleeding. Anti-anginal uh, uh, <coughs> anti agents should be continued until the day of operation. If further pharmacologic therapy is required for recurring angina, an intravenous nitroglycerin infusion can be employed. Intraortic balloon pumping is also effective for preoperative stabilization of unstable patients in the coronary care unit. Prophylactic, prophylactic broad spectrum antibiotics are administ administered intravenously before anesthetic induction and for 24 for eight, uh, for eight hours post operatively. Finally, excellent cardiac anesthesia is essential for obtaining optimal optimal surgical uh, results. The vast majority of procedures consist of simple bypass of the abstracted coronary vessels using either the internal mammary artery or reverse segments of saponous band. In most cases, after immediate sternal tummy incisions, sternal tummy incision is made, the left internal mammary artery is dissected from the chest wall. Cardium pulmonary bypass is instituted using aortic cannulation for arterial inflow and a single right atrial cannula for venous return to the pump. After clamping the ascending aorta, called potassium cardioplegia, cardioplegia solution is uh, cardioplegia solution is infused into the aortic root to arrest and protect the heart. The saphenous vein grafts or internal mammary arteries are then sutured to the coronary arteries beyond the stenosis and additional volumes of cardioplegia solution are infused every 20-30 minutes to maintain myocardial temperature below 15 uh, degree by Celsius. After com completion of the distal coronary anastomosis, the aorta is unclamped, proximal aorta vein graft. Anastomosis are completed and cardio pulmonary bypass is discontinued after adequate, adequate rewarding. An average of three or four grafts are inserted, reflecting a philosophy of complete coronary revascularization together with a tendency to, revert, to reserve surgical therapy for symptomatic patients with multivessel disease. In general, the internal mammary artery is the graft of choice owing to its superior long-term patency. At least one internal mammary artery graft is utilized 
in 95% uh, of procedures, usually to the left anterior distending coronary artery and adjunctive saphenous vein grafts are used for additional vessels. Multiple internal mammary artery procedures can be performed using a combination of bilateral mammary artery pedicles, sequential mammary artery anastomosis and free mammary artery grafts. At present, however, complex internal mammary artery grafting is reserved for patients with limited saphenous veins, younger patients with longer life expenses, reoperates cases with previous vein graft failure, and patients with atherosclerotic calcification of the ascending aorta. Never newer arterial conduits such as the inferior epigastric artery and the gastroepiploid artery are currently being investigated and hold promise for routine all arterial grafting. Prognosis. Numerous risk factors are associated with increased early and late mortality rates after coronary revascularization. In a recent series um, of 1,000 patients, 90 persons had left main of multivessel disease. Half required emergency surgery for refractory unstable angina of or acute myocardial infarction. The overall operative mortality rates average 2% with a 92% per year survival rate. Risk factors for long-term mortality included severe left ventricular dysfunction, advanced age, and emergency operation for acute myocardial infarction of or unstable angina. Considering the serious baseline patient risk profiles, carrying long-term long results of coronary bypass are remarkably, remarkably good and serve as a standard with which other emerging therapies such as a coronary balloon angioplasty must be compared. Performing one internal mammary artery graft independently reduces the probability of late cardiac death and reoperation, but consistent data demonstrating an additional survival advantage from multiple internal mammary artery grafting are not available at present. Coronary bypass grafting significantly improves anginal, anginal symptoms in over 90% of patients long term and the incidence of myocardial infarction is likewise reduced. Successful revascularization improves resting left ventricular wall motion in a significant proportion of patient and enhance exercise ventricular performance. Most importantly, contemporary methods of coronary bypass grafting significantly improve survival in the population of patients with ischemic heart disease. Valvular heart diseases Developmentally, the fibroskeleton of the heart to which the cardiac valves attach is der derived from the endocardial cushions. The fibrous annulus of the mitral valve is a seen and complete ring of fibrous tissue, which is the most apparent, apparent or at two points, the right and left fibrous trigons. The left fibrous trigon is situated at the left anterior 
Anterior. As aspect of the mitral ring and consists of fibrous tissue joining the mitral ring to the base of the aorta. The right fibrous trigon or central fibrous body lies to the in the mid midline of the heart and represents the confluence of fibrous tissue from the mitral valve, the tricuspid valve the membranous septum and the posterior aspect of the base of the aorta. The function of the atrioventricular valve is to the permit an inhibited flow of blood from the atria to the ventricles during ventricular diastole and to prevent reflux of blood into the atria during ventricular system. The valves achieve this objective by a coordinated contraction of ventricular myocardium and the papillary muscle during the cardiac cycle. During systole, the valve is closed, the valve is closed, and the left atrium left atrium serve as a reservoir for blood returning from the lungs with isovolumic relaxation, relaxation left ventricular pressure falls and when ventricular pressure becomes lower then that all the full atrium the valve opens and initiates, initiates a rapid filling of the ventricles Mitral, mitral stenosis. The most common cause of mitral stenosis is still rheumatic fever associated with groove. A streptococcal, streptococcal pharyngitis. The early valvular lesions of rheumatic fever are characterized by an acute inflammatory infiltrate that gradually helps by organization with fibrous tissues. Chronically, the leaflets become fibrotic and sickened so that pliability and surface are, are reduced. Fusion of the anterior and posterior Leaflets may be severe, and in many cases, the commissure can no longer be identified. Calcification may occur in the leaflets, or the fused commissures being more common on the posterior medical aspect. The horde are thickened, shortened, and fused by the same type of fibrosis. And occasionally, the subvalvular apparatus may be calcified. The entire process transforms the mitral complex into a rigid, funnel shaped structure with a fish mouth opening. The most significant effects of mitral stenosis occur on the pulmonary vasculature and right ventricle. Congestion of the pulmonary vessels is, character is characteristic with distension and sickening of pulmonary capillaries. Intimal fibrosis of the pulmonary veins and arterioles also is observed. And in advanced cases, medical thickening and fibrosis are common. Pulmonary hypertension progress with time and may increase to the point of producing systemic levels of systolic blood pressure in the right ventricle and inducing functional tricuspid valve regurgitation. Clinical findings, symptoms and signs. Pulmonary venous hypertension caused by valve obstruction produces the most prominent symptom in mitral stenosis, which is 
this snare. Initially, this snare is observed only with effort, but with time and progressive valve abstraction, this snare begins to occur at rest or at night and is worsened by lying flat or top name. Atrial contraction augments transmitter flow significantly in mitral stenosis, so the development of atrial fibrillation increases mean left atrial pressure and reduces cardiac output by about 20%. In addition, a more rapid ventricular rate decreases diastolic filling time, further exacerbation the problem. Thus, it is common for the clinic status of a patient to deteriorate when atrial fibrillation develops. In clinically progressive cases, patients usually experience worsening cardiac disability or hemoptysis and eventually die from acute pulmonary edema. On physical examination, the patient characteristically appears thin and cachectic with a washed out and sallow mitral face passes. Ugular venous pulsation may be prominent with fluid overload or with secondary tricuspid incompetence. If the cardiac rhythm is atrial fibrillation, irregular, irregular, <coughs> irregularities in the jugular pulse and prominent V waves are observed. Peripheral edema and hepatic enlargement may be present as well as the classic hepatojugular reflux. In the pressure, in the presence of pulmonary edema, respirations are rapid and shallow, the work of breathing is increased and rails are present to varying degrees from the lung basis up the chest. A sternal hair indicates right ventricular enlargement and suggests pulmonary hypertension. In severe cases of pulmonary hypertension, the pulmonary component of the second heart sound is often palpable in the second or third left intercostal space parasternally. Auscultation of the heart reveals accentuation of the first heart sounds in the early stage and with development of pulmonary hypertension, the pulmonary component of the second heart sound S2 becomes accentuated. <coughs> Electrocardiography 90% of patients in sinus rhythm exhibit a broad notched P wave on the ECG, the so-called P mitral. In later stage, atrial fibrillation and right ventricular hypertrophy are cardinal electrocardiographic signs. Imaging, study. Imaging studies. On X-ray, the overall cardiac silhouette may be normal, may be normal, with the exception of left atrial enlargement. Pulmonary venous hypertension is accompanied by engorged, transversely oriented superior pulmonary veins, with pulmonary hypertension, the pulmonary arteries and right ventricle becomes enlarged, displaying, displacing the right ventricle towards the sternum on the lateral projection. Cardiac catheterization is performed 
in the most patients but can be omitted in young patients with classic clinical and echocardiographic findings. Measurements of transvalvular gradients and calculation of valve area provide useful information about severity of the stenosis. <coughs> Moreover, a well diurist patient with a, a contracted blood volume occasionally will exhibit a larger valve area and a lower left atrial pressure than suggested by the clinical evaluation. Thus, it should be emphasized that catheterization findings are only supplemental, and the entire clinical picture must be considered when making therapeutic decisions. <coughs> Medical treatment. Most would agree that asymptomatic patients should be treated medically and carefully observed. Surgical treatment. Mitral stenosis is second only to aortic stenosis in terms of mortality rate among the acquired valvular disease. Thus, available data would support the early election of surgical therapy for this disorder. Surgical therapy should be recommended in patients who are over age 14, those who have severe reduction in valve area at catheterization and those who experience unacceptable limitations on lifestyle. <coughs> Approximately 50% of stenotic mitral valves treated iteratively can be managed with open camisura tami. Absence of significant leaflet calcification together with good leaflet mobility and surface area increases the likelihood of successful repair. Prognosis. The operative mortality rate for isolated primary mitral valve procedures range from 1% to 5% depending on the severity of preoperative symptoms, the presence of severe pulmonary hypertension, so hypertension, right ventricular failure, and the need for mitral valve replacement. Contemporary operations significantly increase long-term survival and patient well-being. After open mitral camisurotomy or valve replacement, most patients experience improvement in symptoms, thought, repeat operation are necessary and a rate of 2-4% per patient year after valve repair. The probabilities of systemic embolization and infective endocarditis are lessened significantly by surgical therapy and patient experiencing an atrial fibrillation therapy uh, for less than one year have an excellent chance of uh, reverting to sinus rhythm with pharmacological therapy of cardioversion or both. Mitral regurgitation. Competence of the mitral valve depends of uh, and integrated function of the mitral annulus, the valve, leaflet, the cord, the the papillary, the papillary muscles, and the ventricular wall. Incompetence can be caused by abnormalities of any of these structures. Rheumatic heart disease accounts for 35. <coughs> 45% of cases of mitral regurgitation. Involvement, involvement of the leaflets by the rheumatic process causes shortening, rigidity, and retraction of the cusps. The harder tenderness also become fibrotic, fused, and shortened. Idiopathic calcification of the mitral valve and annulus in the elderly 
can be important cause of regurgitation and is associated with systemic hypertension, hypertension, aortic stenosis, diabetes, and chronic renal failure. Calcification may involve the entire annulus and project into adjacent ventricular myocardium. Masses of calcium may protrude into the subvalvular region, immobilizing the valve or preventing leaflet coaptation, and calcium can invite invade the conduction system or adjacent coronary arteries. The final category of mitral incompetence is ischemic mitral regurgitation, defined as a moderate to severe valve incompetence precipitated by acute myocardial infarction with a no primary leaflet or cordal pathology. This disorder is observed to a significant degree in 3% of patients with coronary artery diseases undergoing catheterization and is quite heterogeneous both from the pathophysiologic and the clinical viewpoints. Pathologically, the majority of the patients exhibit Posterior papillary annular dysfunction, in which regurgitation and congestive heart failure are coincident with the onset of a large posterior wall infarction. <coughs> Combinations of posterior annular dilata uh, <coughs> dilatation, papillary muscle elongation, loss or papillary muscle shortening, and pre existing congenital leaflet defects produce valve incompetence at the posterior commissural region. Post-infarction papillary muscle rupture occurs more rare, rarely and is observed is only 0.5% of coronary diseases patients undergoing catheterization. Congestive heart failure associated with a few murmur usually, usually Developed several days after infarction, and the majority have severed regurgitation requiring acute intervention. The infarction usually is posterior and it often is small and localized. Global ejection fraction is frequently maintained. Physiologic derangement caused by mitral regurgitation are similar to those associated with mitral stenosis. Left atrial hypertension is transmitted to the pulmonary vascular vasculature, causing dys dyspnea and pulmonary edema. Pulmonary arterial hypertension, right ventricular failure and functional tricuspid regurgitation occur by similar mechanisms. However, an, unlike mitral stenosis, the left ventricle is subjected to a chronic volume overload, which ultimately causes myocardial failure. Clinical findings, symptoms and signs. Symptoms pursued by mitral regurgitation are related to the level of pulmonary venous hypertension. Exertional dyspnea and orthopnea are common, and chronically reduced cardiac output produces easy fatigability and cardiac tachycy. Moderate to severe regurgitation can be tolerated for many years with relatively minor symptoms until a reversible left ventricular dysfunction develops. Therefore, the severity <coughs> Of symptoms cannot be used as the only cr criterion for intervention. Hemoptysis is rarely reported and symptoms occasionally appear with the onset of atrial fibrillation, which complicates 75% of severe cases. 
Systemic emboli can occur in patients with atrial fibrillation but are not as common as in mitral stenosis. Infective endocarditis should be suspected if there are symptoms of malaise, fever, chills, or a new or worsening murmur, or when acute decompensation occurs in a previously stable patient. Angina secondary to mitral regurgitation is rare and should suggest coexisting coronary artery disease. Obviously, patients with ischemic mitral regurgitation usually manifest either acute or chronic myocardial ischemic syndromes. The physical signs of congestive heart failure are similar to those of mitral stenosis. The apical impulse left ventricular enlargement and an apical systole thrill can be palpated. With significant right ventricular enlargement of sternal hair is evident. On auscultation, the heart sounds usually are normal, with the exception of a third heart sound with congestive heart failure or an increased S2 with pulmonary hypertension. The hallmark of mitral regurgitation is an apical high-pitched holocystalic murmur that radiates <clears throat> to the axilla and back. On occasion, the murmur will radiate to the base and have a musical quality. In the pressure of infective endocarditis, peripheral signs such as splinter hemorrhage, Osler's nods, clubbing, fever, and splenomegaly may be evident. Electrocardiography. The ECG may show left ventricular hypertrophy from the chronic volume overload or biventricular hypertrophy with concomitant pulmonary arterial hypertension. In sinus rhythm, P mitral may be present. Treatment Selection of patients for operation The natural history of mitral regurgitation is more variable than that of a mitral stenosis because of the greater number of etiologic factors. The clinical course can range from asymptomatic with moderate mitral regurgitation, remaining stable for many years, to a, full, to a fulminant progression of overwhelming congestive heart failure. There are three determinants of clinical severity. First, the degree of regurgitation. Second, the status of left ventricular function and third, the cause of the valve disease. Significant symptoms are rare until the onset of heart failure, which usually appears late in the overall course. Interestingly, symptoms and ejection fraction don't correlate with medical outcome using a multivariate analysis. This findings suggest that symptoms alone are an unreliable guide to the timing of operating treatment and other factors such as progressive cardiomegaly need to be considered. This concept is further supported by the observation that the operative mortality rate in higher and long-term survival is depressed in patients with severe cardiomegaly. Thus, operation is recommended in chronic mitral regurgitation if symptoms significantly limit lifestyle. lifestyle, lifestyle. Similar criteria for surgical Selection are used in patients with mixed stenosis and regurgitation 
mitral valve calcification or other forms of slowly progressive mitral incompetence. Surgical treatment. Mitral valve incompetence can be managed by mitral valve repair or replacement. Virtually all myxomatose valves with prolapse can be repaired. 50% have isolated posterior leaflet prolapse or hordal rupture and posterior leaflet reconstruction along with carpenter ring and nulloplasty is highly effective. If primary hordal to the anterior leaflet are ruptured, artificial hordes of five number suture are inserted again with carpentous ring annuloplasty. In cases of ischemic papillary annular dysfunction, dysfunction a simple commissural suture annuloplasty combined with complete coronary revascularization is the procedure of choice. In cases of rheumatic leaflet retraction, valve calcification or severe endocarditis, prosthetic valve replacement is in order. And prognosis. Operative mortality rates for elective mitral valve procedures performed under stable condition approximate 2-5% and the quality and duration of life are improved. Occasionally, however, a more accurate clinical course is observed, particularly with infective endocarditis, ruptured horde tendine, or ischemic mitral regurgitation. Under this condition, emergency operations are required. And with extreme hemodynamic compromise, a preoperative intra aortic balloon pump can be produced clinical stabilization. Operative mortality rates in the emergency setting are higher, usually 10 20 percent. Long term survival rates are reduced in patients with impaired preoperative ventricular function, in those requiring emergency operation and in elderly patient with pre-existing multi-organ failure. Thank you very much for your attention.